Hello, my name is Carol May Wittick, spiritual life coach and your host of Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. What is the awakening? This is the moment in time when humanity rises up out of the darkness. Who is awakening? Each one of us present on earth today, reclaiming our sovereignty, seeking greater possibilities in our reality and looking for solutions. We know being awakened is not a lofty ideal but a necessity. If we can transform ourselves, we can change the world. Guests on her conversations will speak to your spirituality, sensuality and soul. Listen to their stories and hear how they are in service to the world. Let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. My guest is Aya Atla, medical astrologer and clinical herbalist. She has created Twin Raven Naturals, her apothecary where she formulates and makes herbal medicine. She has helped countless women restore vitality to their bodies, rebalance their hormones leading to pregnancy, normal periods, reduction in cramps, PMS symptoms and much more. And if you've ever wondered what medical astrology is, listen in as Aya gives a detailed explanation of how it assists practitioners to better diagnose and treat their patients. Also, Aya has chosen van life and homeschooling, and she talks about the value this has brought to her family. So as always, I begin by asking my guests, her is an acronym for higher energetic resonance. When do you feel that higher energetic resonance? Oh, well, kind of like where I am right now, out in nature. I feel so much better when I like get out (laughs) into nature and spend time there. This morning we went on a hike through the woods and just really enjoyed the early morning sun and all the animals waking up. And I'm telling you, I feel like I'm way up here instead of like down super low. So that's my favorite way. Or just even going and sitting by a body of water that's moving. That Mm -hmm. does it for me too. Perfect. Thank you, Aya. And before we get into the conversation today, if you can just give me a little bit of a backstory on who you are and what led you to be living the life and offering your offerings that you're doing at the moment. Yeah, so I'm Ayer Atla. I'm a medical astrologist and a clinical herbalist. I was diagnosed at 19 with endometriosis and was told that basically there was no help that they could offer me. There was no cure. And I was just going to be stuck being miserable forever and more than likely never have any children if that's what I wanted. Tough luck kind of a thing. And after years of kind of just accepting that and, you know, going through and trying the different things they did offer, which again, didn't help or do much, I decided that I was going to take control of my health, that I was in control of my body and nobody else. And I found herbs and acupuncture and massage and chiropractic and energy work and all this stuff. And I healed my body using all of that. And at 28, I had a baby. They told me I would never have without any interventions at all. 100%, you know, just me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, um, Yeah, she's almost 11 now, and it's been great, but I just never wanted anybody else to go through that or have that same story that I had of struggling with my periods and infertility and just being told by somebody who you, you know, felt as an authority that your body was just never going to do what you wanted it to and you could never heal it. And so I went back to school. I got my I got three degrees in clinical herbalism, and then I um, combined that with my use of medical astrology and started helping other women who had similar stories. And we've been doing that now, oh, well, since 2012. So I just absolutely love it. And it's seriously like the best thing (laughs) that I have ever chosen to do with my life outside of, you know, having a baby and having my daughter. But it's, yeah, it's been amazing being able to help other women overcome these stories that they're told that they will never be able to do X or never be able to do Y and helping them empower them to know that they can do that and watch their bodies heal and them get exactly what they wanted, you know? Perfect. So good. And I think it's so apt at the moment as well when it seems like the um, the leaning towards pharmaceutical as a cure 
which you know <laughs> we don't you know we can go into that deeper but it but there there is now uh, a generation or at least a couple of generations of people who have no faith in the body to heal itself or mm -hmm. any faith in the fact that we're surrounded by nature of all descriptions and like up until maybe like 100 100 and how where are we now 120 odd years ago the mm -hmm. everything was you know you'd go out and you'd pick a herb or you'd you'd rub a potion and and that's the way that everything was done naturally and then of mm -hmm. course everything got twisted and it got turned into this pharmaceutical industry so that anything that's natural is deemed as the most ridiculous woo mm -hmm. idea that yeah. could be possible and it's now inviting people to go back to realize that nature has always been here and even despite our best efforts to eradicate it nature still exists um how do you start to um speak to anybody who maybe they come to you as a last resort like unfortunately a lot of the time people turn to nature as a last resort <laughs> for some you know because of the because of the programming because mm -hmm. of the belief system and explain to them that um that nature knows best nature the, the the way that their bodies work the way that we're provided on the earth all the means by which to live on the earth how do you go about um showing them inviting them to trust that they, this is possible and if not just possible is actually the best and the the most the most natural way yeah sometimes it uh, it takes some i wouldn't say convincing because i don't want to convince anybody i don't want them to fully embody it and believe it but it takes some time sometimes for them to remember that part of themselves that they they can trust their bodies and to get back to nature so a lot of times it's baby steps let's like really starting to encourage them like hey just get up in the morning and go take a walk outside for 10 minutes. That's it. You just got to do 10 minutes outside in nature. And that's all I want you to do for the next like month. Every day, get up and take a walk in nature for 10 minutes in the morning. And then keep a diary and tell me how you're feeling. And when like two weeks passes, let's check back in and see if you've noticed any difference in your body. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times they'll be like, oh my God, I lost like three pounds and I wasn't even trying. And I've noticed that my anxiety is lessened and my depression is better and I have more energy throughout the day. And I'm like, okay, let's keep going. Let's make it 20 minutes now. And we start baby stepping our way through into that. And then we really work on a lot of mindset. Like, why do you believe that your body can't heal itself? Why do you feel that that's an impossibility? Why do you feel or believe that somebody else knows your body better than you do? Why do you think that you have to go to somebody else every time you have an ache or a pain or a sniffle or a sneeze? do you do they know your body better than you and we really talk through that in the conditioning that we have that every time you have a sniffle a sneeze an ache a pain uh, you know anything that you have to go put somebody else in charge of your body and healing it and and then what we talk find, about sorry to what do you find is the most common response to it when you're asking those questions well, they went to medical school. They know best. They they just, they know what my body needs. And I'm like, okay. So they went to medical school, but do they live in your body? Do they know what feels right for your body? Do they understand how your body's feeling now on a level that, you know, like literally on a cellular level, do they understand this? No. Yes, they went to medical school, which is great. I'm not knocking it, but like that does not give them the power to know your body better than you will ever know it. You live in that body. You're with it 24 seven. You know, when it feels right, you know, when it feels wrong, you know, when something's it, you innately know when something is off in your body. And if you sit still long enough and you ask your body, now that it's talking the language of symptoms to interpret that symptom into a language, you understand what's going on and what do I need? It'll tell you, you don't need to go somewhere else and ask them, Oh my God, I got an ache in my knee. What do I need? If you ask your body, your body will tell you what it needs. And that's learning to reconnect with your body. I find in the society that we live in now, people are very disconnected from their bodies and they are afraid to be connected to them because they're taught that their bodies are, you know, something to be ashamed of and their inability to heal is just crazy. And they just, they can't feel safe 
in knowing their body. They can't trust themselves to know their body because they didn't go to medical school or they didn't study pharmaceutical drugs for the last 20 years of their life. And they feel unsafe in trusting that they know best for their body. So we really work on a lot of mindset and getting past that and understanding that, you know, you really do know your body and you know it really well. And nature provides everything you need to fix whatever is wrong in your body Mm -hmm. and trusting that the solutions found in nature are safe and that they are effective and that they will do what you want them to do, you know? And, and how do you, start to build that reconnection to the with them with their own bodies like what exercises are you suggesting that they take I know you you encourage them to start moving and and take a walk are there other practices that you guide them to we do a lot of grounding work um And by that, I mean, literally, like, put your bare feet on the ground. (laughs) Let's go sit on the earth. Let's, you know, and really work with that. Let's take our electronics and leave them in the house. And let's go outside somewhere and stay out here for two hours and just really connect to the earth that way. Um, I really work on different forms of meditation with them where you really have to sit in your body and be comfortable with it. And I find at first, most people can make it maybe a minute before Mm -hmm. they are really uncomfortable and they don't like just sitting there listening to their body and the stuff around them. And they feel like upset. Sometimes they sometimes will start crying. A lot of times they feel like that withdrawal because they don't have their electronic device right next to them or whatever. And over time, as we work on building up their resilience to it I find before you know it they're doing like 30 45 minutes and they feel like no time has passed but that initial like your nervous system is just overwhelmed with everything going on out in this our society and everything that a lot of times sitting still and just being quiet is very hard at first and so we really work on you know finding ways to be still of regulating that nervous system breath work is an amazing thing for that so we do a lot of breath work exercises and then i do a lot of shadow work with my clients where we really delve deep into why they're afraid to be connected to their body and why grounding is so scary. And then we work through those, those issues emotionally and mentally. And then we add in herbs to help with the physical symptoms that they're experiencing and even the psychological symptoms and really help heal their bodies from the inside out. Mm. What, what are the fears that come up of, and, and I recognize that as well, you know, n- noticing the, people find it very hard to just be just be in the quiet mm-hmm. not not even be able to just sit in a room and not feel that they have to feel every moment with a conversation or then if they you know like just sitting and being in the room and not speaking to anyone feels uncomfortable feels rude almost mm-hmm. you know so that, that everything has to be filled up or the fact that they're always kind of reaching and looking for something whereas um that I, I'm trying to think of, a, I, I did a um, podcast a while back when I was looking into that and the thought of um, people just sitting and being with themselves, they'd sooner take an electric shock. Actually, there was a mm-hmm. study done and I can't recall it to the mind, but it was, they would sooner take an electric shock and, and, and suffer the pain of that jolt of electricity than just sit and allow things to come with them what is what is it so confronting and so frightening do you feel that uh, that people would sooner endure pain than just be with themselves and their thoughts and whatever comes up a lot of what i find is that they're afraid of what their mind is going to tell them or they're afraid that they're going to have some terrible memory pop up and they're going to have to deal with those emotions and they don't want to They don't want to feel that fear again that maybe they felt that's coming up. They don't want to feel that sadness, that anger, that upset. They are afraid of like literally just feeling those emotions and getting them out of their body. And they don't want to sit in the uncomfortableness a lot of times. And they don't want to like 
have those negative emotions come up because we're taught that negative emotions are terrible and nobody should have them and suppress them. And so they feel like if they sit there and they're quiet and they start, their mind starts bringing this stuff up and then they have to become angry to work through it or they get upset or they're, you know, something that something's wrong with them and they don't want to be looked at as different or something's wrong with them or have people make fun of them for it. Or have people, they, they don't afraid of people seeing who they really are and then hating them. And that's really just your ego trying to protect you. Like, oh, if you're really who you are, they're really not going to like you. So let's just pretend to be somebody else, which is, you know, a viable uh, safety measure for certain things. But it's not a safety measure for everything. And so your body you know, kind of lies to you sometimes about like, oh, it's safer to just not have to feel it. It's safer to pretend to be somebody else. It's safer to pretend to be okay. But as we're seeing in society, pretending to be okay is not okay. We have a lot of people that are very sick mentally and physically and emotionally because they're just suppressing, allowing their bodies to feel and they're suppressing the ability to you know, work through that and it's leading to symptoms because there are most of my clients that have said they're afraid of that. I have a client who literally is like, I said, we were talking about crying and she's like, oh my God, as we've gone through this together, I'm crying all the time and I don't like it. I don't want to cry. And I said, well, why not? What's wrong with crying? She's like, well, I always got yelled at when I cried as a kid. And I said, okay. I said, is anyone yelling at you now that you're crying? She's like, well, no. And I said, your, your partner, I said, do they yell at you when you cry? She said, no. I said, when you do cry, what does your partner do? And she's like, well, you know, they come up and they want to hold me and they, they are, you know, there for me if I need them. I said, okay. I said, so why is crying so scary? I said, is there anybody in your life now that is going to scream at you or physically harm you if you cry? She's like, no. And I said, so your brain is lying to you. Your brain is telling you a story that's not true. It's telling you you're going to be injured or harmed in some way. I said, so you're feeling uncomfortable with it, which is, you know, a normal feeling after you've experienced that, right? I said, but now the story you need to tell your brain instead is, look, I cry now and I'm safe. My partner, you know, doesn't yell at me. My partner holds me through this. My partner supports me in this. I have love and support and understanding and it's okay to cry and uh yeah it's been a process but (laughs) they've gotten to the point now where they are more comfortable crying because they understand that it's like their nervous system's way of resetting itself and that it really works but we had to work through the reasons why they felt uncomfortable you know and that's really what it is it's past stories and then not wanting to sit with those feelings and emotions that I find most people have like the most difficulty being still for. They just don't want to relive any of the past pain. And I mean, I get that. Trust me. I totally get that. I've had my own share of past issues, you know, that comes up, but you can't fully heal if you don't move those old stuck emotions out of your body. Mm. Oh, I agree with you as well. And, and same, (laughs) I know, you know, I know what it's like and I know what my, my drug of choice was like just too much sugar, (laughs) sugary things and, and, and like heavy foods and everything like that. So I understand what it is to feel something come up and not really want to go there and to use whatever it is to, to push that down, but then realizing, okay, I might be avoiding that, but I'm giving myself another issue here. So allowing that to come up and it's not comfortable and it's not necessarily pretty and like you say if you're not doing it in a place and a in a um, environment that you feel safe and um safe and supported and allowed to be that and not judged for being a human being with human feelings then you're just going to keep pushing that pushing that down and that reinforcing that story that got made up when you were a child for the most of us really you know it's amazing how those things will carry through and will temper our experience and our full expression of of who we are as we go forward um i want to talk also about how you incorporate astrology into the work that you do yes yes i get this question a lot because everybody's like how does that work so yeah um, medical astrology was actually um, one of the main ways of diagnosing and determining treatment for individuals from like as soon as astrology really became a thing on until about the early 1900s to 1940s, depending on which 
book you read in about the history of it. So it was a class that physicians were required to take. They had to pass it to be able to become a physician, and people would not go to see a physician if they did not know or understand medical astrology because they were considered a quack if they didn't know it. And they were really considered like, well, how do you even know how to treat me? Because you're just literally guessing. You haven't even, you know, you don't even know my body. You're just literally making things up. And so um, it just fell out of favor when, you know, the big push for pharmaceuticals and um, the other, just all the stuff that we all know became more the mainstream and they started pushing the more natural stuff out of the way. And so it's something that most people don't even know about anymore or even know how it works. So it's confusing. Um, But basically the premise of it is, is that when you see a client, you run their natal chart, which takes their time of birth, their date of birth and their place of birth and determines where all the planets were in the sky at the time of their arrival earth side. And then Based on where those placements are, we can see what's going on in the body. Each planet, there's nine planets in astrology. And so the first seven are the main ones. Those are the ones we look at the most. This is the sun, the moon, um, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury. So those are the ones we really look at the most. And then we really look at the North Node and the South Node as well, which are mathematical calculations based on where the moon was in its placement in your chart. So we really look at those ones the most, but the outer planets, the outer three, which are Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, those are more of like our psyche and our psychological side. So if someone comes to me with more psychological issues, those are the planets I look at more. So in their planetary placements, depending on what sign they are in, depends on what problems we may be having in our body. So each sign was starting with Aries and working all the way through Pisces was assigned a section of the body. So like Aries starts at the head and then we work our way through till we get to Pisces, which rules the feet. And then each planet has a certain like ability about it to produce some kind of symptom or health issue in our life. So for instance, the sun is like our life force, our life battery, right? So this is where we get all of our like energy from. This is where we get our length of life and our uh, like vitality, right? Of our body and how well it works. The moon is the distributor of the vital force. So it is like the I always say the sun is like your battery and the moon is like the wires that take that energy from the battery and distribute it throughout the body. So depending on what sign your moon is in, depends on how well that vitality gets to other organs in your body and is giving them the life force that they need to sustain your life and then be healthy. Um, And then Saturn and Mars are the two malefics in astrology. So we really look at those two if people are having health issues because they're the ones that are more likely to be afflicted in a chart and cause the most issues. So Mars is very much what we call the seat of inflammation. He's a very um, inflammatory causing planet. Um, Causes a lot of inflammation mainly through heat. Mars in astrology is actually a hotter planet than the sun. And it rules Aries, which is also a very hot sign. So um, it also kind of governs the immune system a little bit. And in this case, because it's such... um, a great like force, right? Mars is the warrior planet. Aries is the warrior. And so because of that, the immune system in a native Aries who has it in a Mars placement, let's say, is completely off the chain. They are the kind of people that as soon as they get sick, they immediately will get like a super high fever. And within like 24 hours or less, they'll be better because they just burn everything out of their body, right? They use heat and inflammation to fix any issue in the body. But as we know, chronic inflammation can lead to issues, right? Because it obstructs blood flow and nutrients getting to the organs. It causes all kinds of potential damage to the cells because they can't get the water and nutrients that they need. So it can be a cause of issues. And then Saturn is the exact opposite of Mars. It's very cold. It's very damp. It's a very suppressive, restrictive planet. And so when I see issues that are in the Saturn placement, I tend to see them because there's not enough blood flow to an area. Mars is typically, there's too much blood flow to that area and Saturn is the exact opposite, not enough blood flow. So there's not enough nutrients getting there. So both issues are mainly caused by lack of nutrients to that area 
But why there's a lack of nutrients is what we're treating that. Like in the case of Mars, we're not going to give more heat to open up the blood flow because they're already too hot. So we would give cooling remedies, like cooling demulcent herbs. We would give like bitters, which are very cooling and drying to pull some of that excess heat out of there and help support the liver and detoxifying the body and getting rid of some of that heat, right? Most of the heat in people's bodies tends to be held in the liver or the spleen or the stomach. So bitters are really great for all of those body systems. So we would want to cool, whereas with Saturn, we want blood flow to that area. So we would use a lot of like warming remedies that uh, are great for your circulation and help speed up the circulation and help bring it to that. Depending on where in the body that stagnation is, we would want acupuncture to open that up or yoga poses or even breath work to that area. Certain stretches are great for that to get that blood flow going back. And then the other planets, Venus, Jupiter, um, are a little more of what we call like the benefics. They're less likely to cause health issues, to, but depending on where their placement is and what is across or next to them can also influence that. So Saturn and Mars, anything that's next to them in your chart or even 180 degrees away from them will potentially have issues caused by the influence of those planetary placements. So when I look at someone's chart, I can literally see exactly how their body is cosmically designed to work, like their whole cosmic blueprint, if you will, of their body and how it's designed to work and then why they're having this specific symptom that they're having or health issue that they're having and then immediately know exactly what they need on how to fix it and how we can pull that affliction away from that section of their chart and start balancing it back out and bring the body back into balance. And so then we immediately start on that stuff. And it's been the best modality that I have ever used because every herb corresponds with a planet. So all the plants correspond with the planets. And so then you know if they're having trouble with Saturn, um, you may want to use a Saturn plant for that, but you may want to use, like I said, more of like a Mars or a sun plant because those are going to be more warming plants, right? So uh, just knowing each sign and each planet and what they do and what herbs are governed by them and what body systems really just helps me figure out exactly what's going on and how we can support the body in healing itself. That is fascinating. That's amazing. I feel like I'm having that. I'll, I'll be enjoying this as I listen to it again, as I'm putting this together, I'll be learning so much about it. So, so what you're saying, if I understand, and if I don't correct me, that so as we're, we've, we're given our chart, we have our chart on birth, and you would be able to maybe look at a child's a baby's chart and see potentiality that they could mm -hmm. encounter during the course of their life? Or is there anything external that might kind of like mitigate or affect that? Um, there are obviously some external things, but the beauty of being able to see the chart at birth and really get to know your child's body on a cosmic level can really point to ways to prevent any of those potentialities from occurring. And that's the other thing, too, is if I see someone's chart and they're not having a problem in a certain area, but I can see that that might happen based on like the current transits in the sky or the future transits that are coming up, that that may cause an issue, then we will start on preventative measures for that and make it less of a possibility and sometimes no possibility at all. It just really depends on how um, much they're truly influenced by where the current transits are and the future transits and how well they you know, kind of stick to what they know they need to do. You know, we're all human and we're not 100% perfect all the time. So, you know, sometimes we don't always do everything we know we need to do <laughs> when we need to do it. And so, you know, it really depends on that and just also depends on how much they truly believe that their body is capable of healing itself and not ever having these problems, mm -hmm. you know. And I find that fear of problems or potential problems or health issues in fact is far more of showing me that that's going to actually happen than anything else the fear of something makes it much more likely to happen in your life than if you don't fear it so if you use this chart and you see it as like for your child and you're like oh, okay that's a possibility 
but you're not fearing that it's actually going to happen, the chances are pretty great that it's not going to. Mm -hmm. I find the more afraid someone is of, let's say, having a heart attack at a young age um, because they have their sun sign in Leo and Leo rules the heart, the more likely they are to have a heart attack than the person who has the same placement but says, oh, that's not going to happen because I'm taking my herbs and I'm doing my thing and I'm supporting my body and I know I'm going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. And how do how does that relate? I mean, there's you know we've come out of this pandemic situation, but also there are there have been some major transits, and I can't call them to mind. You'll know this as an astrologer um, that are slower moving ones. Is it Pluto, Uranus? What's just happened recently in the last couple of months? Like, forgive me Pluto. and my ignorance. <laughs> yeah, Pluto moved out of the placement it had been in for, oh gosh, how long is Pluto? 200 years or 200? It's close to like 200 years and it moved yeah. into a different placement, um, which happens, but it's really slow moving. And so because of that, um, Pluto deals with like death and reincarnation and like the dark shadow side of our psyche. And so that movement um, literally kind of, shows exactly what happened in uh the world right with the whole pandemic and everything mm. um because you know it deals with death and dying and uh, all that fun stuff that we all saw happen you know yeah it just moved into aquarius so aquarius is an air sign and Aquarius is in charge of the electromagnetic field of the body, the heart. It's in charge of um, a lot of like outside influences, like bothering your body and becoming an issue that leads to, you know, uh, a health problem, um, mainly with <laughs> electrical magnetic issues. Um, so it okay. tends to a lot of heart issues sometimes because of that, because the heart is basically just, you know, a, an actual battery and it has its own electro, you know, electromagnetic field and uh, frequencies and everything. And so Aquarius really deals with that. Um, Aquarians tend to not have, be able to access and use salt appropriately in their diet. So they tend to be a little dehydrated um, often because of that, which also tends to lead to then heart issues as well and other things because of the fact that um, we don't have enough salt, we don't um, conduct electricity properly in our bodies. And so Aquarius is also like a really good teacher in the Zodiac. It really likes to learn things and then teach it to others. So there's usually a lot of like great lessons that are learned in um, an Aquarius placement. And like I said, Pluto deals with death and rebirth and reincarnation and all of the stuff that a lot of uh, people are very scared of, right? There's many people that are terrified of dying. Mm -hmm. And so this placement in Aquarius is just very much teaching us that, you know, death is not necessarily a scary thing. It's a natural part of the life cycle. It happens from death comes new life. And, you know, we're seeing that now there's a resurgence of like babies being born and stuff. So we've had a bunch of death, but now we're, you know, life does go on. We can continue. We can grow and learn from that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a rough placement in Pluto sometimes, though. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. <laughs> so is it so so as that's happening, then is it that depending on an individual's placement, that external placement will affect them differently? Or is it kind of like a collective experience? There's a lot of collective experiences that happen in astrology as well. And the pandemic was more of one of those and less of an individual thing. Now, as far as the people that were more afflicted that did end up potentially passing or now have, you know, like lifelong symptoms from it, they potentially means they had a placement without looking at their chart. I can't say for sure, but they potentially had a placement that was more affected mm -hmm. than others and so while it wasn't a placement that was going to end in their death it definitely was a placement that is going to give them some trouble now for a longer period of time um, and again most of the reasons was because nutrition <laughs> nutrition 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 um the pandemic really stripped a lot of people of the nutrients when they did get sick that their body needs to heal and without properly replacing those 
we find, you know, what happens if we don't have enough nutrition, our body can't survive and go on. So I want to speak about your lifestyle, actually, because that's another thing that's fascinating to me. The fact that you live just outside of society. And I'm a, I don't know if I told you before, I'm just an avid when I when I want to kind of like zone out and just watch like interesting things on YouTube. I'm always watching people who live alternative lives, you know, mm-hmm. so they then like they're off grid or they live in tiny homes or they live they live on the road. And um, you've done that and you made that transition. What what prompted you to make that transition and how how has it worked out for you? I mean, you're still doing it. So clearly there's something going on that's going right for you. Just like, because, yes. like, because I'm feeling as well that more and more people are considering different ways of living, you know, mm-hmm. especially if you are paying attention to the way that things are potentially going and the kind of the overreach and the kind of encroaching control of where people can be and can't be like you know like who's asking mm-hmm. information but you know can be and can't be as according to what is trying to happen particularly with technology really closing in and fencing people on uh, fencing people into spaces um also the things that are happening with currencies as well and i think if that really happens And then unless we've managed to or enough of us have managed to create systems that are outside of that system, then if you're still dependent on that currency system, that financial system, Mm -hmm. then that will be kind of like the the bolt, the bolt in the door behind you and you'll you'll be stuck in. But you've managed to kind of pull yourself away from that way ahead of time. So kudos to you. But just talk me through that. Yeah, so. Oh, let's see. 2017, I met my now husband and we just, I don't know, we hit it off really well. I was a single parent at the time with my daughter that I mentioned earlier. That's my uh, miracle baby. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just her and I, I'd gone through a really nasty, horrible divorce and had managed to, in the aftermath of all of that, buy us a house and feel like I had some stability because prior to that we were going from like apartment to apartment um, and it was just too much you know there wasn't any stability so I got this house and we were just like living life I met my husband and um, he just really added to it instead of taking away from it or making me feel like I had to try to divide my time between him and my daughter he Um, so we ended up a year after meeting, we got married and, um, we had the wedding, we did all of our stuff. Right. And like, we were on our honeymoon at Disney world in Florida. And we were like, I just don't know if this is what I want to keep doing when we were talking about going back to work. Right. We were like, Oh my God, we got to go back to work on Monday. And like, we were just really enjoying, like, I don't know, feeling kind of cut off from society for a little bit on our honeymoon um and just not having all those responsibilities of having to get up every day and get the kids to school and get over here and get to work and stay at work all day and then fight the traffic to come home and so we really just started talking and then like what do we really want is this really what we want forever and we ended up you know honeymoon goes over we go back to work and within like two weeks of being back I was working like 80 to 100 hours a week he was working at least 50 because they were closing a project and they needed his assistance at work and we were getting up at like 5, 5.30 in the morning, leaving the house by like 6, 6.30 and not seeing each other again until close to 8 at night. And that was including the kids in that whole thing. And we just looked at each other after like two weeks of being back to this and being exhausted and never seeing each other. And I was like, and he said it to me too, why are we doing this? Why are we living like this? I never see you. We got married and we've seen less of each other now than we have in months. Like, why are we doing this? This is ridiculous. This is stupid. I don't want to live my life this way. The kids never see us. They're having behavioral problems at school. They're exhausted all the time. Like, this is just not something that we want to continue doing. You know, so within a month of really having that conversation, we had both started researching. We met back together and I was like, so I found this really cool thing out. And he's like, okay, what'd you find? I'm like, people live in their RVs on the road 
on purpose. And he was like, oh my God, I found the same thing. What do you want to do about it? And I was like, I don't know, but I didn't know that was a thing. And this seems like a viable solution, right? Like we could get rid of this house and 90% of our bills, like that would save us a ton of money because we were, even with two of us, two incomes struggling to, Mm -hmm. you know, make ends meet between having to pay all the bills at the house, which we lived in a Southern state in the U S and anybody knows in the summer, it is hot, hot, hot. And we have to have our air running 24 seven. And so our electric bill in the summer was close to like, you know, four or $500 a month. Wow. And so we were paying that on top of the mortgage and then all the other bills and never seeing each other or spending any time <laughs> in the house that we were paying astronomical amounts of money to, you know, cool off. And we weren't seeing the kids and it was just exhausting. And so we said, well, let's, let's just try it. If we hate it, we can go back to whatever right so we put our house in the market within a month we had a full offer and we closed on it a month after that so within three months of making the decision to do this we had sold our house sold 90 percent of our belongings bought an rv moved into it and moved to an rv park that was close to both of our jobs and we kept going to those jobs and living our life like that right and we really wanted to hit the road but we just didn't have jobs that could go on the road at that time right so we were trying to come up with what we could do but i'm telling you even in those like few months that we were living in an rv in an rv park like close to our works we were still (laughs) super happy uh we'd had so much stress taken off of us because we didn't have as many bills to pay our mortgage had been like 1500 a month and now we were paying 400 a month and that included all of our utilities like it was just like so much stress relief, but unfortunately we're still fighting traffic every day to get to work. And it was taking us two hours to get home at night. And we were just, just didn't want to live in that rat race anymore. And so um, we were talking about like what we could do for jobs on the road and everything and having these conversations over the summers and August comes and my husband gets laid off and we were like, Oh crap. <laughs> Like, now I'm the only one working, and this is just, you know, now what do we do kind of a thing. And we were looking at each other and said, well, thank goodness we don't have the house still, because if we had the house still, we wouldn't be able to support it on just my salary, now with all these extra people living in it and being the summer, all this stuff, right? And so I looked at him, though, and I said, well, why don't we take this as, like, our answer from the universe and go actually hit the road? And I was a nurse at the time. And I was like, I can do travel nursing. I did it before I had a kid. Like, it's not that hard. I'll call up my recruiter that I used to have. I'm pretty sure they would be happy to have me back. And he was like, that's a thing. And I was like, yeah. And I hadn't really considered it because, well, he was working and we have kids. And like, it just didn't feel as viable with children as it did when I did it before when I was single and no kids. And it was just me and my dog. And so we looked into it. I called up my recruiter. They were like, hey, we'd be happy to have you back. We got a contract signed within like like two weeks of deciding to do that. And we hit the road in September of 2019. And we've been on the road ever since. We absolutely love it. We just found that this was for us. We were like super nomadic people. Um, I had had my business doing the medical astrology and herbalism, but it had really been more of like a side thing because as a single parent, I was like, I need to have a steady income, you know, to take Mm -hmm. care of my kids. And so now that we were doing that and then he wasn't working, so he was home all the time, like we had more freedom for me to be able to do that. And I was working way less hours. I was only working 36 hours a week instead of 80. So I was able to really start building my business. He was able to start a business and those have just like shot up exponentially since we, you know, kind of took those leaps. And that's all we do now is my business and his, he's a solar tech. He installs off-grid solar for people living in vans and RVs and off-grid cabins and all that fun stuff. And so we um, started doing that and we started off in a 35 foot trailer um, and decided that that was just way too big and we didn't like how it traveled and it made it hard to get into certain spots that we wanted to go to and our kids had a whole bunk room in there but they never spent any time in it they always wanted to be next to us they wanted to be in our room or in the living room with us and i was like why do we have all this extra space if we're not going to use it so we downsized to a 21 foot travel trailer 
and um, with a toy hauler, and it had a garage in the back. We converted the garage to the kids. They were literally like five feet away from our bed. They were super happy because they were right there. And we did that for, I don't know, a couple years in that one, I think. And even that started feeling like it was too much. So we have now downsized to a van, and we travel in a van, and we just go wherever people um, contact my husband and say that they need some solar and we come to them and he installs it. So currently we're in Tennessee because he's installing some solar here, but I don't know how much longer we'll be here. Um, he has a potential um, client coming up here in the next week or two. If he gets that, then it's in the same area. We'll stay here a little longer. Otherwise we'll move on to wherever. And um, it's been fabulous. Our kids love it. Um, our oldest daughter, um, he came with some kids into the relationship. So he, our oldest daughter uh, said for her birthday, she wants a van and she wants to start caravanning with us in her own van. So she, uh, we're looking actually currently looking for that for her and get her started in her own. And I don't know, like they're super happy. We started homeschooling and they love it. And it's just such a more relaxed way of life. Like we, don't have to get up at like five o'clock in the morning anymore if we don't want to. And let me tell you, we don't. <laughs> so we don't. <laughs> None of our family are super early morning people. And so we don't get up like that anymore. We sleep until our bodies are ready to wake. And because we live in a van now, we're much more closer to like the rhythms of nature. And so I find that we wake when the sun gets to a certain point and then we take our early morning walks and we get our drinks going and we eat some breakfast and we're just like, we just are more able to be and it's not so much like go, go, go all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's been better for all of us. All of our mental healths are better. Everybody's physical health is better. Um, the kids are happier. I asked them, I said, you know, are you guys missing school? We can stop and stay somewhere and you can go back to school. And they're like, oh no, please don't make us do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to stay in one place. That sounds horrid. So yeah, we've just, we do this. People think we're crazy. They're like, oh my God, how do you do that with kids? We have a dog as well that comes with us. So they're like, oh my God, you got kids and two adults and a dog in that van and how do you do it and I just tell them well we don't spend a lot of time in the van mm. the van is the the sleeping quarters the van is the kitchen for cooking the van has the bathroom but other than that during the day you won't find us in the van if it's good weather and we only tend to go where there's good weather we follow the weather now instead of being stuck somewhere where it's like freezing cold and snowy if it starts getting freezing cold and snowy we move to somewhere that's not freezing cold and snowy so most of our day is spent outside. The kids are outside learning and doing school outside. I'm outside doing my business and my consultations and doing my readings and things like that. My husband is literally outside on someone's roof putting solar on, you know, like we just don't spend a lot of time inside the van anymore. And we spend a lot more time together as a family and it's made us much stronger. And so if anybody is like, oh my God, should we do that with kids? Yes. Yes, you mm -hmm. should. It's totally amazing. It's a great lifestyle. My kids are happier and healthier than they've ever been. Um, all of us are. My husband and I's relationship is so strong, and I don't think it would have gotten there if we literally continued working 80-hour work weeks and never saw each other. Hmm. Stands to reason. I just see, I just get the impression that more people are so much open to the idea of it. I think you get lulled into this sense of um, what what life should be like and what creature comforts are and and most of them are convenient distractions at the end of the day because when mm -hmm. you think about what you really need it's so it's so little i've gone traveling before so i've yeah. lived for months out of one suitcase and even mm -hmm. then you know I've, I've traveled and i've got one big suitcase and a small one I usually find that I've taken the wrong the wrong things with me the fabric's too heavy so i'm usually down to about you know three or four three or four things that I'm circulating and the, the, yep. the majority of it is surplus so it's so much lighter it's so much lighter when you're just existing on what you need to just keep your body covered mm -hmm. and then getting on with your life it's when you come back into western that yeah. you get pulled into all of these things and it does feel really heavy but um it does thank it's you. really surprising how much you don't need oh gosh to yeah. survive like my and they have a rule because again we live in a van and there's how many of us in there um that if you bring something in then something old has to go out 
So, like, if you want a new toy, that's great, but we don't have space for infinite toys. So, if you want this new toy and it's a bigger one, then you have to decide what of your older stuff that you wish to donate, you know? And a lot of people go, oh my God, that's so mean. You're poor kids. And it's like, no, not my poor kids. They're very happy with that. And they go, oh, well, you know, I really don't need this thing anymore. I don't use it. Let me go give it to somebody who does need it. And my kids are much more giving and generous now with their stuff. And they're choosing to, like, no one's forcing them. We don't pick the toys for them. We're not just snatching it up. It's their decision. And they they love it. They're like, oh, we're getting to help other people now. And they're finding that they just don't need as much stuff. The things they ask for now, we want art supplies to draw. We want clay so that we can do projects. We want, uh, you know, they want stuff that is like artistic and creative and they can, you know, do things with that uses their imagination. And I find they don't want those needless distracting toys. Like, they used to ask all the time, we want a tablet or we want a phone or we want you know, all these electronics. And they don't ask for those anymore. They don't even care if they have them. <laughs> mm. It's the same with us. We don't have a TV in there. Um, if we want to watch anything, we have a tablet that we will watch stuff on. But for the most part, we just don't watch TV anymore. Our circadian rhythm is so synced with nature that by the time evening comes, we don't want to watch anything. We're exhausted. The sun went down. We've had all that red light in our eyes and we're ready to get, go to bed. <laughs> so we're in bed at like 8, 30, 9 o'clock anymore. Yeah. We don't find we need those distractions anymore. I think we all need those distractions because so many of us really hate the life that we're living yeah. and maybe we don't even realize it, right? Because like you said, you're conditioned to believe that you need this giant house and all this stuff and six cars and you got to work a job 20 hours more a week than you want to and all this stuff that you don't even realize how much you truly don't like that life that you're living and how much you hate it. That you need those distractions to get you away from that. And now that we love our life, I don't need those distractions anymore. I don't mm -hmm. care what's on TV. I don't care about the latest fads of anything. I, it just doesn't, I don't know. It's just not, not necessary anymore to mm -hmm. keep up with the Joneses, you know? Yeah. And, but it, it, it was never, well, like you say, it was never necessary anyway. It's that distraction and it kind of um, folds back into what you were saying at the beginning about be, people being disconnected from their bodies because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then having this big fear of actually sinking into what their bodies are telling them, what their mind is, what their thoughts are, because they have all of these distractions and they're kind of like being distracted and entertained and told what mm -hmm. to think about certain things. And now that you go back to nature, you just realize how surplus these things are to actually having a real true connection to what life totally is. Um, it's, it's such a such a good such a good sharing and a, a, and a great message for everyone to just remember, you know, what what's real and what's not. But so thank you so much for that. Um, before we we wrap up, I just wanted you to just share a little bit more about your company and what you do and then where people can find you if they want to work with you on any level. Yeah, definitely. So my main clientele are <clears throat> women or individuals with ovaries and uteruses that are usually between like 20s to like early 50s that are experiencing like some sort of hormonal imbalance. They're having wacky, painful, or like really heavy or even too light periods. They are struggling with infertility. They have endometriosis or PCOS. They are gaining weight and can't lose it. Their hair is falling out. So anything that just really indicates there's an imbalance in their hormones are the people that tend to find me and seek me out. And I think maybe that's just because I went through my own thing. I just radiate, you know, that, hey, I know how to fix this. Mm. Um, and so I work mainly with those, but I will do medical astrology readings and, you know, any, for anybody, but I just, women um, with those issues just tend to gravitate. So that's my main clientele. Um, and I work with them through medical astrology and herbalism and holistic ways to rebalance their bodies, bring them back into harmony and, you know, heal the problems that they came to me for to begin with. And so I do that, like I said, through reading your natal chart and herbs and very holistic manner of approaching everything um, in your body and not just the symptoms. It's a very holistic management, not a, not symptom management like allopathic medicine is. And um, 
yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Twin Raven Naturals. That's my apothecary's name. And then um, you can find me at my website, which is twinravennaturals.com. And on there, you can download my free hormone balance guide, which walks you through the steps on how to rebalance your hormones naturally using exactly what nature gave us, which is nutrition. And then uh, you can also schedule any of the appointments with me through there. A medical astrology reading. Um, I have a um, program that's um, becoming very popular where it's, Um, You enroll into that, and then you get all of my courses, all of my teachings, all of my knowledge basically wrapped up into one place where you get um, lifetime access with just one low price to be able to access that at any time. It walks you through all the like steps that I would walk you through if we did one-to-one, but on a much more affordable price for those who maybe have um, a budgetary concern. And there's other people in there with you that are going through the same thing. So you got a community and you have support. And then we do live group coaching sessions and you get a medical astrology reading when you join this program and uh, a protocol of herbs and holistic stuff to follow. That's literally, you know, for your body and exactly what your body needs to heal based on your chart. Um, we do a in-depth one and a half hour consultation at that time as well, and really get to the down to the nitty gritty of what's happening and how we can fix that. And then you get all of that knowledge. So that is a great way to work with me as well. If you don't have, um, you know, the budget to maybe do one-on-one with me, um, this program is literally like the best way to get all of my knowledge and access to everything um, to help heal your body on a very holistic and natural way. So that's called my Welcome to Wellness program, and you can sign up for that through my um, website as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing everything with me today. And um, I hope people reach out to you because you're a wealth of knowledge. And I've learned so much from you just listening to you, especially about the medical astrology. That's been a total fascination. And I, I sense that we're moving back to those times as well. So as busy as you are, I think this is going to be more going forward. So thank you. Yeah, I feel that too. I appreciate you having me on here. I am so grateful that we got to talk today. Yeah, anytime. Thank you, Aya, for being on this episode. And thank you for listening. Remember the journey to embody her, embody higher energetic resonance, three steps closer to being the woman of your dreams is available for you to take free. The link is in the show notes below. Also, to find out more about me and my spiritual life coaching, find me at my website, carolmaywittick.com, C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E-W-H-I-T-T-I-C-K.com. I'm on Facebook under Carol May Wittick and on Instagram as Kazmik, C-A-Z-M-I-C-K. Also, do tune in to Her Conversation's sister podcast, Her Inspirations, Each week I delve into a topic from a psychological and spiritual aspect and each episode will end with a practice of meditation, visualisation or breath work for you. So thank you again for seeing me through another episode. Until the next one, take care. Thank you. Bye.